So think back to your last extended family gathering. Let's say, you know, Aunt Mildred turned 65 or something like that. Um, you, don't, you don't really want to be there. Um, this, is, uh, this is especially true if you're a scientist like me. You don't have very good social skills. Um, <laughs> I, I can see my, my dinner table from last night uh, nodding vigorously in the back. Um, <laughs> Uh, which, is, uh, which is ironic because I'm a social scientist, um, so sort of the oxymoron of a lifetime. Uh, it's like, like being a vegetarian assassin. But any, anyway, you're at this gathering, and there's usually a point in the evening when Uncle George has had about 10 glasses of wine, and he says to you something along the lines of, you know, money doesn't buy happiness. I well, I I'm German, so I suppose this would be delivered in sort of a drunken but stern German accent. Um, but so when he, when he does this to you the next time, I want you to tell him that he's wrong. And for the rest of the talk, I want to tell you how we know this. Um, so there's, there's two reasons to be interested in this question. Uh, the first is that you want to extricate yourself from this conversation with Uncle George. Um, but the second is that there are still about a billion people in the world who live in abject poverty. And I think it's really urgent that we solve this problem, and I think that asking this question can be a first step uh, in that direction. So the kind of poverty that I have in mind uh, is first and foremost economic poverty. So not having enough money to buy food, uh, being unable to pay for health care and education, uh, raising children who face similar prospects, and so on. And over the past few decades, uh, economists and other social scientists have tried to understand how we can alleviate poverty. And so let me take a quick detour and tell you uh, about a tool that we use to do this. So randomized controlled trials take the idea of clinical trials and apply it to uh, social programs. So we work together with partner organizations and we take a poverty alleviation intervention in which we're interested and the partner organization delivers it to a randomly chosen group of people, and then comparing those people to others who didn't get the program allows us to make rigorous statements about which interventions work and which don't. And so this approach has been very successful over the past few decades in identifying poverty alleviation interventions that are successful. So some of my favorite examples uh, come from attempts to increase school attendance in developing countries. This is very important because children there often don't go to school uh, with very bad long-term consequences. And so, suppose you had $100 to spend to increase school attendance, what, how should you spend them? So, it turns out that you can buy about an extra week worth of school attendance if you simply give your $100 to poor families you can buy about an extra three weeks of school attendance if instead you make the money conditional on families sending their children to school. But it turns out that there's an even better intervention available, which is information. That buys you about an extra three months of school attendance for every hundred dollars that you spend. And it's an interesting intervention because it works simply by providing information to parents about the returns to education that their children can expect when they do go to school, which the parents often underestimate. So I want you to notice three things about these numbers. The first is that there are large differences here. And so it's useful to do these randomized experiments to find out which the effective interventions are. The second is that the interventions that work well aren't necessarily the ones that we would have expected. So for instance, the effectiveness of information, that was a surprise to many people. And third, and that's the point of departure from my own work, this very effective information intervention, that happens entirely in people's heads. There is no change in macroeconomic policy or the institutional environment or corruption or anything like that. It's purely a change in the way that parents think about the returns to education that has these large effects. So what that suggests to me is that these small nudges at the level of individual people's, individual people's psychology can be very effective at alleviating poverty. And that in turn says, I think, that we might be able to develop even better poverty alleviation programs if we first try to understand better whether poverty itself has a psychology. So could it be the case that poverty has particular psychological consequences. So for instance, what, does it lead to unhappiness, stress, depression, and so on? 
And secondly, could it be the case that those psychological consequences in turn have effects for economic behavior and decision making that make it difficult to escape poverty? So if you put those pieces together, you have something like a psychological poverty trap. And so over the past few years, I've been trying to understand whether something like this exists. And I want to tell you what I've learned, but I want to start with two caveats. Um, the first is that asking these questions isn't the same as saying the poor are somehow to blame for their poverty or that they're somehow intrinsically deficient. In fact, it's doing the exact opposite. It's asking whether all of us might experience particular psychological consequences or behave in particular ways if we happen to find ourselves in a situation of poverty. The second point is that I don't think these psychological channels, if they even exist, are the only ones that are important. There's many other important ones, you know, macroeconomic policy, institutions. We should work on those as well. But I think we should also ask whether psychology has some role to play. So what have we learned? Let's start with this first question about the relationship between poverty and psychological outcomes. And let's first ask it just at the level of a correlation. Is there a correlation between poverty and happiness, for instance? Now, for a long time, we didn't think this was the case. This is the somewhat condescending view of you know, happy poor people sitting under palm trees having a good time. Um, with new and better data and maybe newfound respect for the poor, um, we now know that this isn't true. So the best science now shows that there are, in fact, large differences in happiness between rich and poor. And this is true both within countries and across countries. So within a country, the poor are less happy than the rich, but also poor countries on average have lower levels of happiness than rich countries on average. And this is also true for stress and depression, so poor people are more likely to be stressed and depressed. So this is at the level of a correlation, but what we really not want to know is whether there's a causal relationship here. Um, and to answer that question, we need an experiment. But obviously, we can't increase poverty ethically, but we can do the opposite. We can decrease it and ask whether that has positive psychological consequences. Now, it turns out there's a wonderful program out there that allows us to ask this question. Give Directly is a charity that uh, has as its mission to collect donations from people like you and me and send them directly to poor families in developing countries. These are called unconditional cash transfers, which means that the families get to spend the money ho however they wish. The, the idea here is to treat the people as the grown-ups that they are and not patronize them by telling them what they should do with the money, but instead letting them make uh, their own decisions. And so we were interested in this program for two reasons. First, it's a very interesting poverty alleviation intervention in its own right, and we wanted to understand how well it works. But secondly, it's the perfect setting in which we can ask the scientific question. So does this very definitional alleviation of poverty, simply giving people money, also make them happier? Does it make them less stressed and less depressed? So together with my friend and colleague Jeremy Shapiro and our partner organization, GiveDirectly, we ran a randomized controlled trial in Kenya on this program that covered 120 villages, about 1,500 households. And GiveDirectly delivered to these households unconditional cash transfers of about $700 on average. This is roughly two years of per capita income. And a year later, we came back and we asked how these transfers had affected people's psychological well-being. And we found that the people who had gotten the transfers were much happier than they would otherwise have been. They had lower levels of stress, lower levels of depression, and when they got very large transfers, we found that that even led to reductions in cortisol, the stress hormone. Um, by the way, I should say we also didn't find increases in spending on tobacco and alcohol. Uh, the, the alcohol result, of course, being of particular importance to Uncle George, uh, who is uh, very concerned about his $8 being spent on, on alcohol. Um, you know, meanwhile, he himself has moved on to the tequila phase of the evening, uh, which always works out well for him, but he's happy that the poor are making better decisions than him. So that means that when you uh, alleviate poverty by giving people money, you improve psychological outcomes. This is why Uncle George is wrong. So money does buy happiness. Now, if uh, Uncle George at this stage is sort of still sober and with you enough, um, he, he will say something like, 
well, but what about lottery winners? I suppose I'm, for, I'm forgetting that he's German, so it would be something like, Johannes, what about the lottery winners? <laughs> so what he has in mind are these anecdotes of which there's no shortage that when people win the lottery, they essentially ruin their own lives. They make imprudent financial decisions and they end up being worse off than they would have been if they hadn't won in the first place. Now, it turns out that that also doesn't hold up in the data. Uh, so the best science now shows that lottery winners on average are actually a lot happier than, than non-winners. So that's an attempt to answer this first question, the relationship between poverty and psychological well-being. Now let's turn to the second question. Could it be that these psychological consequences of poverty have implications for economic decision-making that make it hard to escape poverty? And there's two ways that you might imagine this could happen. The, the first is that the, the stress that's brought on by poverty might affect economic choices in subtle ways. And there's now evidence suggesting that um, when you're under stress, you're much more impatient than you are when you're not stressed. And that's not a good thing if you're supposed to make long-term decisions and investments in things like healthcare and education. And so on this view, poverty causes stress, stress makes you impatient, and then that impatience doesn't help you to lift yourself out of poverty. But there's a second sense in which the psychological consequences of poverty um, might exacerbate poverty, and that is that they may simply incapacitate you. So when chronic stress turns into full-fledged clinical depression, it's very hard for people to keep earning a living. So you don't think your efforts will amount to anything. You know, no amount of information about returns to education can convince you otherwise. Uh, it's hard for you to even get out of bed in the morning and your livelihood crumbles. And so this is bad enough when you're wealthy, but it's worse when you're poor and you don't have as much of a safety net to fall back on. So as a result of this, there's an, a silent epidemic of depression among the poor. And that's a problem not only for psychological well-being, um, but also for economic outcomes. So if we think that this feedback loop exists between poverty and psychological well-being that then leads to more poverty, the next thing we want to do is break it. So how can we do that? Well, there's two obvious points where you can think about intervening. One is on the poverty end itself, and the other is on the psychological end. Now, I've, I've already told you that intervening on poverty has positive psychological effects. What I haven't told you yet is that it also has positive economic effects. So in our study, we find that the people who receive the transfers have higher levels of consumption a year later, they grow their asset holdings, they grow their businesses, they improve their economic lives in a very general sense. Uh, this is also true for other programs. Many other studies have found similar results. Um, but we d what we don't know much about yet is how effective it can be to intervene on the psychological end. So there are now simple versions of psychotherapy available that can be deployed in low-income contexts. You train lay people to deliver them. And they've already been shown to, effective, to be effective in, in alleviating depression, but we don't know yet whether they also have positive economic benefits. So that's my big question for the future. Can we think of psychotherapy as not only an intervention for psychological well-being, but also a tool that people can use to improve their economic situation? So there's now studies underway in a number of different countries that will give us an answer to this question, and I'm really excited uh, to learn that answer, as is Uncle George. Thank you very much. Thank you.